you know, not, none of these projects I'm going to demonstrate or I'm going to show are on organic fields. Okay, okay, okay. But I think that there's still lessons to be learned, and I think that it's an opportunity that we could maybe work together and think about um, how the, the, the studies and the, the findings of these studies can translate to organic production systems. I, 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 I do think there's value. So uh, let's all work together with that. And if you throw some food at me, just don't throw the sourdough. They're too, too valuable to good. Okay. So the, and this is a very broad topic, right? The, the build fertility and provide nitrogen with cover crops. And so when we talk, or when I talk about cover crops, there's really sort of two, um, you know, the two categories I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the grass cover crops and what they do. And I'm going to talk about the legume cover crops and, and what they do. Now, um, also the other thing I'll say here is that we're, what I want to present here are things about that are the short-term effects of cover crops, use of cover crops. So uh, there's, a, there's a substantial amount of work that's been done to look at the long-term benefits of cover crops and building organic matter, and those things are true. They're highly variable. But what I'd like to talk about is it's those little things that uh, that happen with cover crops and those little things that we might want to tweak and overcome to make sure we can use cover crops every year without uh, without problems. So this is a uh, – there was a, a review of cover crops uh, and their effects on corn yield. And let's see if this comes up. No? 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 All right. Okay. So this is uh, – what this is here, this is the effect of, of um, grain, or I'm sorry, grass cover crops and the effect on the next year's corn yield. So if you grow a grass cover crop, what's the effect? And you can see this is uh, positive would indicate that it, corn yields go up, negative would indicate corn yields are going down. So at this point in time, across 68 studies across the U.S. and Canada, it tends to skew a little bit negative. With, we're using grass cover crops can steal a little bit away from, from the next year's corn crop. And then the complete opposite effect is generally seen with legumes. Legumes tend to have a more positive effect, right? So there's some things with this where you're breaking up, you're getting a different type of crop growing. So you're, you're breaking, you know, you don't have that grass on grass. Yeah, so it's a legume grass rotation, right? So, so legumes generally have this, um, this benefit. So if these legumes are so great, how come we're not using them more? And maybe that's more of a question in, for conventional systems and organic, but I think that there are huge benefits. And you got to think about how do we, if we're going to use cover crops, the legumes have a, have a tremendous benefit. So how do we get more of these in uh, these plants? So the easy thing to do is if you've got winter wheat uh, or a small grain crop, we can get some red clover frost seeded into winter wheat. That's a, that's a pretty established practice. We can drill seed some cover crops following a winter wheat harvest or any sort of early, you know, any sort of uh, summer harvested crop if you've got uh, a vegetable crop or anything like that. So anything where you can get them planted early. So the, obviously the problem with or the limitation to legume cover crop is they need some time to grow. So we need to have those kind of systems. But those are systems that work well. The ones that are possible probably under understudied or, or uh, underused or, or certainly need a lot of um, trial and error to get them to work are this idea of interseeding these legume cover crops into corn. <clears throat> so we, we're going to have that corn growing. It's a high nitrogen domain crop. Can we get a legume planted in the understory for some potential benefit? And then more difficult is uh, getting, if you have corns and soybean, is waiting to the end of the year to plant the cover crops. Generally speaking, we're not going to have enough time to get that legume going, to get enough biomass to get, to get some real benefit, unfortunately. So um, let's focus on those those first <coughs> couple. All right, so all the work that I'm going to show here today was funded by the Fertilizer Research Council, but it has the same approach, and I think that that's why that um, this data can translate. So we're going to either plant the cover crop or not, and then we're going to grow the next cash crop, typically corn here, and we're going to do a nitrogen rate study. And so we're not interested in what the optimal nitrogen rate are. We're interested in what the difference in the optimal nitrogen rate is. So we use these nitrogen rate studies to determine how much nitrogen legumes are supplying uh, to a corn crop, or in some cases, a little spoiler alert later on, how much that rye cover crops can be stealing uh, nitrogen away from that next corn crop. So it's the relative difference. So it doesn't really matter what the nitrogen source is, per se. We could use a whole range of them. Um, but it's that difference that we're going to identify the effect of that of that cover crop. Okay, so 
the first thing I'd like to talk about is frost feeding red clover. Um, you know, so this is a case where uh, we're going to go out early in the year. Uh, we want the snow to be, so this is the winter wheat was planted the previous fall. We're out in March, uh, maybe early April. Snow's off the ground. We got, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit dry so we can get out there. And we're just going to uh, overseed uh, that red clover on top of that, uh, on top of that soil surface. So uh, in this case, the previous harvested crop was soybeans, so we've got some pretty good, uh, we got we have enough exposed soil, and we're going to look down, we have that nice, this is like perfect conditions right here, right? We've got that nice cracking in the soil, uh, so maybe that seed can fall in that crack, we're going to get that a little bit better seed soil contact uh, when we're just overseeding. <clears throat> so then what's going to happen, right, is that, that winter rye is going to take off, the red clover, the, what I like about red clover, it, it knows its role, right? So it, it, it doesn't try to do too much. It'll grow, it'll get out of the ground and it'll grow. And it won't keep trying to grow and, and kill itself like rye right, does. So if we, we tend, if we intercede rye, rye tends to keep going and gets all spindly and then kind of chokes, it kind of kills itself. <clears throat> but, but red clover will just hang out in that understory and just wait. So then you take off that winter wheat, boom, that red clover takes off. It's still got a lot of, it's just several months of growth in front of it. Uh, the other nice thing about it is it does choke out the volunteer uh, winter wheat. So this is a strip of with where we didn't interseed red clover compared to where we did. And you can see it's a lot of regrowth. Now, in this case, we're able to grow a lot of biomass at this point in time. So one of the benefits, we think, is that if you wanted to reduce some risk, is you could go ahead and terminate in the fall. You've grown enough biomass. You could, uh, you could terminate in the fall. You can certainly let it grow into the spring and manage it in the spring, but there's always that little bit of that issue. It's a lot of biomass. Um, we actually mow this back one point in time because it can get a little moldy. So we are mowing it back, but we're growing a lot of biomass and we can terminate it in, in, the, in the fall. So then we can do things like this, and we've seen some pretty positive results where, um, so I, uh, just to kind of orientate everyone for how these trials look, is that we're going to have, uh, you know, so this is nitrogen rate on this axis, and that's not, there we go, nitrogen rate on that axis, corn yield on this axis, and so this is, the blue dots are uh, following a cover crop, and the red dots are without a cover crop. So we can look at, well, two things happen here. And what I'm going to always, I, I like to use a lot of nitrogen rate, so then I can get that plateau, and it really helps identify where that optimal end rate is, so we can see really where that breaking point is. So, this is uh, some research we did in Janesville now, I guess a decade ago. Okay. Um, sorry, I just based on my own mortality right in front of everybody here. Um, but huge benefit, right? So we saw a yield bump out of it, and we saw a clear nitrogen credit out of it where we're seeing, uh, you know, we're seeing a 25 bushel yield increase. We see it's supplying about 46 pounds of nitrogen. I mean, even at the zero nitrogen rate, you can see how much nitrogen, how much greater the yields were, right? So these, these clovers are, are certainly are providing nitrogen. So we say, okay, well, let's keep, let's keep going with this. Let's, and so we started some more research at our Arlington Research Station that we had some stuff in rotation, and uh, we, did, we saw some weird, a little bit of odd results in 2016 where we actually saw a bit of a yield drag at some pretty high, high yielding conditions. But if you look where that blue is, the blue is the red clover at the zero, you can see at the zero, we're getting huge uh, yield benefit from it. But the, somehow there was something that was inhibiting the, that was suppressing the, um, the maximum yield. But clearly it is also supplying nitrogen, about 57 pounds of nitrogen. 2018, uh, we saw some yield loss. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm not, I'm not that good, apparently. But um, there was nothing clear about that corn that looked like it was there would be any sort of a yield drag on it. You know, it's like these sort of light yield effects that we're seeing. Um, but in the last year we did, we didn't see a yield loss. We saw a 100-pound nitrogen credit of this red clover. Every year, every year we're always seeing, at, at, when we're not putting any nitrogen out there, yield, much bigger yields when we have the following that red clover. So that red clover clearly works. So whatever those little tweaks of the system are to, um, to maximize yields, I'm not sure what the limitation is, but we did four, uh, we, so we got four years of this data, and every year a clear nitrogen benefit anywhere between 40 and 100 pounds of nitrogen. So, clear 
uh, clear benefits if you can do that. I don't know what the deal is with the yield loss because we did see it in our data set in two or four site years we had a little bit of a yield trend. So I don't know what that uh, what what is causing that at, at, at ma- when we're trying to achieve maximum yields. All right, so that's a, I, I like that. I still like that one. I'd like to get some more. Um, you know, obviously it'd be great to have as many site years as possible. Um, so we'll, we'll continue that work. The other thing is, if you don't want to do that, you know, the frost seeding of the red clover, and I get it, right? It's, a, it's something you got to get out in the spring. There's a, there's maybe some some risk with it. Um, if you don't want to, if you don't want to have two crops growing at the same time, there's still obviously plenty of time left over after winter wheat or anything that's harvested any time in in uh, late July to mid August to get these uh, other legume crops growing. So uh, we've also played around with pristine clover and crimson clover planting. Uh, now the nice thing about these is that they winter kill. So you're going to plant them afterwards. They're going to you can put on a fair amount of biomass, and then they're going to they're going to die over the winter. So less less to manage. Now the crimson clover compared to the pristine clover in the studies we've done always looked a little I don't know. Always looked a little scraggly, a little let or a little more scraggly than the pristine clover, but it still it still uh, did quite well. This is a picture of the crimson clover. Uh, we grew a fair amount of nitrogen in the above ground biomass here. The pristine clover tended to always have a little more nitrogen in the above ground biomass when planted at the same time. Now the trouble is, it depends what your goals are, right? With using cover crops, also is that when you have systems like this, and especially if you're harvesting the winter wheat, you've got a lot of exposed soil. So uh, here's what they here's what the fields look like in the spring. If we can grow enough biomass, I was thinking, well. This pristine clover and the spring residue, it's enough dead biomass, or maybe you can get some, some halfway decent erosion control, or at least you break it up a little bit of the raindrop impact. The crimson clover tend to fall apart a little bit uh, more quickly, and so probably isn't going to be able to uh, give you uh, that kind of erosion control if you're looking for that. Um, and then the second year we did the study, we even got more nitrogen thrown in these systems, 81 pounds of nitrogen in the above ground biomass, 70 pounds uh, with, the, with the crimson clover. Now that's not what's going to be contributed to the next year's crop, but we know that we're growing a lot of nitrogen and most of this is coming from, it's new nitrogen into the system, right? It's fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere, and so it's new nitrogen into the system. And we always check, we always check to make sure they were actually nodulating. And, and this, to some extent, it does, this doesn't quite matter because it's really the amount of biomass that's grown and it's the C to N ratio of that plant, it's the decomposition of the plant. But um, it's most of the time, if we're talking about these systems, it's probably going to be under a low nitrogen environment. There's probably not going to be a lot of excess nitrogen for that crop to take up. So we really do want to make sure they're nodulating to make sure uh, we're maximizing the total amount of nitrogen that we can grow. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing here in 2016. Um, some slightly different effects. Crimson clover tended to have the clear nitrogen credit and the bigger nitrogen credit, even though I said that it didn't actually produce as much nitrogen, although they were similar. They tended to have a, they tended to have a more clear nitrogen benefit, where in this case, crimson produced almost 50 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, the pristine, uh, but the crimson clover tended to not have much of an effect on yield. The pristine had a little bit of the opposite effect, where there was a there was some nitrogen that was supplied, about 15 pounds, but it had more of a, a yield bump effect. Um, and I guess I'm just presenting this one year, but we can t- when we did the work again in 2017, the same same type of result. So I thought that was interesting. So it's sort of um, you know they both work. They're both there's both uh, there's economic benefits to both of them. And um, but you'll notice here uh, at the zero end when you go down to the zero end is that crimson clover that really more clearly uh, had that nitrogen benefit when we're not applying any nitrogen. So, um, some interesting stuff there. Always, I would say I would recommend both of them. They're, they're great cover crop, legume cover crops to get started with because there's just less to manage if you have that time to get planted. So then the other thing is, well, uh, what about interseeding red clover into corn? Now this is, this is going to be a little bit goofy because we're, uh, in conventional systems, right, uh, we have a lot of corn on corn, and I'd love to be able to get that rotation broken up. And so the idea of interseeding a red clover helps break up the rotation, maybe. 
Um, so we'll have to think about how this will work. But so you can think about what I've done here is I'm planting, I'm growing corn, I'm interseeding, I'm planting that red clover in between those corn rows. What I'm doing is I'm growing corn again, but you can also grow any other crop, uh, any high nitrogen domain crop that you'd want next. We can look to see if there is a, a benefit to this. Okay, so what we're doing is, uh, this is a picture from some of our preliminary work, but we're, we are working in a no-till system here, is that we've got a modified drill. We're basically planting, when the, when the corn's about V3, V4 growth stage, we're going to go in, we're going to drill in uh, the red clover. And then the beauty of the red clover, and this is why I like it so much, just hangs out. And we've done a lot of, like, will it grow kind of, kind of trials at different experiment stations, and the red clover always did well. So we thought, what? Okay, so we, it can grow, but what, what benefit? You know, it's like, is this just something fun we're doing, or is there a real, is there a real benefit to our production system here? Okay. So the benefit would be, is it supplying nitrogen? So this is in uh, August, and it's just hanging out there. Uh, we get to later in the year where now we're getting a little more sunlight in there. It starts to, to perk up a little bit. And then uh, this is, uh, so we harvested in, in mid-October, and then a couple weeks later, we, had, we, we got lucky in this year. We had a little bit of uh, good growing conditions, and we put on a, a good amount of biomass. So the trick here, though, is I still haven't grown that much biomass, right? So opposed to like the red in when I'm frost feeding and I've grown quite a bit of biomass in the in the fall, and then I can just go ahead and, and kill it. Here I did I let it grow to the spring, and I didn't kill it until the until the spring. And so then we have these different kind of setups where, um, and you may not be interested in all of these. Let's focus on the ones where let's focus on the never. Um, so we in, in, we had the same corn uh, planted every single year with no cover crop, or we would plant it in one year and look at the effect the next year. And so, uh, so basically we're, we're interceding one year, the, the clover's growing, we're going to terminate it, and then we're going to see how much nitrogen is supplying to that next, that next corn crop. All right, so um, here's our results, and I know that we're, this is a little, little messy here, but uh, the, the number, the the clover, when clover is planted in 2017, and we looked at the yield the, the next year, we saw a, a, a slight yield benefit compared to no to the no clover, and we saw about a 15 pound nitrogen credit. And so even, uh, and that's this this top line here. Um, and so this is just a different way to present this using more probably I don't know more sophisticated statistics where it, where we're really everything's always a, has an error term on it, right? We don't always show that in academia, but just, there's a, the, the, that cloud of data or that, that those lines are the, the error term. But slight yield benefit, slight nitrogen credit, is that worth it though, right? We saw four bushels of, you know, four bushels uh, of corn. We saw uh, a slight 15 pounds of nitrogen. So that wasn't, these weren't the bumper yield benefits and bumper nitrogen benefits that we had seen in other, in other rotations, unfortunately. Uh, interestingly, when we kept, when we kept growing the, the rye or the red clover every year, it actually had a slight suppression effect on yield, where that's that middle one where we would grow the red clover every single year. Uh, but it was supplying nitrogen. I'm not sure what's going on with that. The, uh, we did it this next year as well, and we saw really no effect, unfortunately. So, um, the game here is I don't know if I can grow enough clover. I can't get enough biomass, you know. So even uh, even though it sets up and will grow in that understory, by the time that corn's taken off, not enough time for putting on some biomass in the fall. The question is how long do you want to let that grow into the spring? So if you're planting something later, this will have I think this will work. But the fact that we could only wait so long before you know in this study we have to plant corn again. But if you're going to plant something later, uh, later in May, maybe even June, maybe a, a later season vegetable crop or something like that, you can put on a lot of biomass. That might be that might be the trick. But we were just sort of temperature limited uh, across the past uh, last two years with that. So kind of an exciting thing to try, uh, and it grows. So that's good. I haven't been able to calculate a benefit. So, where, uh, you know, how do we get more legume uh, cover crops planted? 
I think really it's that following winter wheat, or you know, if you can, if you want to start with something, get those get those persimmon and crimson clovers planted. I think they do a great job. And if you want to be a little more adventurous, try that frost seeding. I think the idea with the frost seeding is you can grow more nitrogen, uh, so there's a bigger bang for the buck, maybe uh, more risk though as well. So we're still, you know, when that we talk about is it possible with that interseeding into corn. Uh, I think it's possible. I think that's going to have to be more explored for I mean, I still think we've got plenty of data. Yep, it'll grow, but what's, what's, what value are you going to get for it? All right, so, um, and that's a trick, plant them early and often. All right, so going back to this is like we have this the other issue of uh, the, the rye uh, and what are the grass crops and this general trend where we see these negative effects to, to production. Now, Huge benefits, right, for water quality, um, where it's taking up excess nitrogen that would be leached to groundwater. Huge benefits to building organic matter, right, that uh, that higher carbon to nitrogen ratio biomass that that you're you're, you're using. It. If you can use that every year, is going to help lead to to gains in organic organic matter, and also just something that can grow later in the year. So, you know, a lot of production systems are limited to the to the grass cover crop. All right, so the, uh, this again is a single year effect type study. I want to understand what's the, what's the effect of growing rye, if you have rye as a cover crop, and then you're going to grow corn the next year, what, what are some limitations or benefits? But I, I, spoiler alert, there's some limitations here. So the, what, what we did, and I, get, and I get it, I get it, this is not probably a type of production system, but it's something we can, I think we can learn from. So in this case, we're going to say, okay, we're going to focus a little on dairy systems here. We've got corn silage. We're going to harvest corn silage. It gives us an opportunity to get some manure out in the fall, and we can plant a cover crop. So we're going to harvest corn silage. We're going to put out uh, manure, and then we're going to plant a cover crop. And then we're going to let that cover crop grow. And so I compared a couple different cover crops, uh, and then we're going to uh, some of the cover crops winter kill. Some don't. We're going to terminate those in the spring. And then we're going to grow corn again, and we're going to see uh, and see what happens. So uh, here's some pictures in the in the spring. So we compared. We always had a no cover crop control, and we also had uh, we also compared spring barley. We like spring barley. Uh, oats probably would be very similar. They're going to grow a little bit faster in the fall compared to maybe some other grasses, but they'll winter kill, right? So you've got something growing, and you don't have to go out and and plow it under. Um, but the trade-off is you don't have as much, you know, you don't have that good erosion control in the spring, if that's what you're looking for. Um, and we also tried annual ryegrass. I, I guess my problem with annual ryegrass is across our studies, sometimes it died and sometimes it didn't. And so I guess, I feel like we've got some in, in, in Wisconsin, I think this is going to be, uh, this will happen quite often. We've got cover crops that will always seem to winter kill, like oats and spring barley. And we've got cover crops that'll always survive the winter, like winter rye. So where does annual ryegrass fit in? And maybe some of you are using it. You've got it to, to fit in your system, and that's great. Um, but in terms of these other things, it's kind of I was, we always found it kind of fell in that in between. So we conducted some work across our uh, our three experiment stations, and the really the name of the game is biomass production. So very similar to like the legumes, we want to grow as much biomass as possible, and that the more biomass you're growing, the more nitrogen, we're going to see a bit of that, the opposite effect, where the more nitrogen you're growing with the grasses, the more potential high up. And so that's why I just wanted to give a sense of what, when I'm talking about these biomass ranges, what am I talking about? So this is a field where I got about 700, 500 to 700 pounds of biomass. Um, here's a field where I got about a thousand, about a thousand pounds of biomass. Um, this is a bit of a, a magic number that I'm going <laughs> to demonstrate here. Where now we've got pretty good. We've got a, we got a, we got a good amount of biomass. We got so we have good erosion control. Um, we have a little bit of exposed soil in there, but not too bad. And it's a uh, so remember that number. We talk about a thousand pounds of biomass. This is what it looks like. Two thousand pounds gets you that complete soil coverage, right? So if your if your goal is you know if you're looking for Really good erosion control. This is a this is a game, and then above that, you can get up you know three thousand. Now you're just you're getting growth in this direction. Everything's filled in, and you're getting growth in that direction. 
I throw this slide up, only this is the amount of cover crop biomass for every cover crop, for every year, for every location, just to demonstrate the variation that we get um, from year to year, right? So when we talk about cover crop research and cover crops, you know, talk about this idea, you know, I don't know if you hear the same concept, do cover crops work? Well, it's so dependent. What cover crop are you talking about? What, what are the growing conditions, right? So some years we didn't have, you know, like in one year the annual ryegrass didn't grow that well. Most cases the winter rye always grew, but sometimes we got, you know, less than half, you know, less, you know, less than a quarter ton of biomass. Sometimes we got over 2,000 tons. Oh, 2,000 tons of biomass. So uh, everything is so weather uh, specific, but it gives us an opportunity with this type of data then to say, okay, now we've got all these conditions where we have a different amount of biomass grown, and we compare that to what the effect is. Um, and so we've gone through those kind of things here. Let me. So what I can do is I can graph up things like this. For every location, I could figure out uh, for each cover crop, I compared it to the no cover crop. And did the cover crop increase or decrease the yield, corn yield, or have no effect? Did it? Uh, and how much nitrogen? Uh, what's the effect on the nitrogen? So. Um, So I could graph stuff in sort of this sort of quadrant, um, where on this side would indicate less nitrogen was required to optimize yield, and if the data came out on this side, it would indicate more nitrogen was required. So you can see most of the data uh, either falls in like a really small effect around plus or minus 10 pounds, we'll call that a wash. Uh, and but quite a few of the data points came in on this side where more nitrogen was required to achieve maximum yield um, following uh, rye. And we can also look at did it increase yield or de decrease yield. So if it's, a, if it's above this line, we had a couple instances where we saw an increase in yield. But most of the time, it, we, we saw data around plus or minus four bushels. I call, I'm calling that a wash. Um, or we saw the, these yield drags. And I want to kind of talk about some of these things because um, there are, if you have a lot, if you have exposed soil and your goal is for erosion control and building organic matter, we need to use winter rye. So we can't have it be detrimental. So let's, let's delve into this a little bit. So based on this data, we came up with these, these recommendations where uh, I think they things fell into some pretty specific categories. If you're growing a thousand pounds of biomass or less, it's not going to have an effect on your, uh, on your manure nitrogen credit. So you're putting out that manure in the fall with the idea that it's going to be available to that next crop. This cover crop is effectively stealing nitrogen from that, uh, from the manure. But as long as we don't, if we have less than a thousand pounds and you get to that thousand pound mark, right, where that's some good erosion control, not going to have a big effect on that manure. Once we get to that one thousand, one thousand or above, that's where it starts to steal it. So when I set up this study, right, I was sort of like, my, the goal, the idea was, in the perfect world, that cover crop would only take up the nitrogen that was going to leach out anyway. But it taps into the amount that you may be expecting to be available to that next corn crop, or whatever your next crop may be. All right? So uh, if you get that 1,000 to 2,000 pounds, say it's going to steal about 35 pounds on average from that, from your manure, what your expectation to be. And if you're growing 2,000 pounds or more, you yeah, get 2,000 pounds or more of that, it's effectively wiping out that manure nitrogen credit. So um, we put out about, uh, so about 10,000 gallons of liquid dairy manure. It was roughly about 100 pounds of available nitrogen that we're expecting to be available to that next corn crop. And in those cases, it wiped it out. Matt, yeah. can I ask a question? I'm back here. Yes. Why would I'll see you Aaron gets the microphone. I, I know. I get to interrupt Matt. I'm going to talk. Do you but, see this? But okay. why would I just want to make yeah. it just as, as we think through it. I, I want to stress that with, with the interseeding um, and cross-seeding, we do a lot of that within our organic rotation. So mm -hmm. um, there's a, a, a lot of, a, a huge amount of relevance in terms of um, the, uh, those techniques with cereal grains. Um, and the WIC, the integrated, Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems trial, and the organic rotation, just like Matt was stating in his data, Bertin Clover is planted after winter wheat harvest for an end credit for corn the following year, and that's, that's proven to be um, a very effective method. But when we're looking, why wouldn't you get that end back when that rye is worked back into the soil? 
Right. So that's a good question, right? And that's the, it all comes down to that carbon to nitrogen ratio of that plant biomass, right? So these are relatively high. It's a lot of carbon. It's a little bit of nitrogen, a lot of carbon. So when the microbes go to break this material down, okay, hold on. There's sorry. There's there's two aspects to that, and if I'm, I'll, I will I will address that in a second. But it's let me find what I want here. Okay. There's two issues that are happening here at the same time. One is the, cr- the cover crop itself is taking up, the, physically taking up the nitrogen from the manure, right? So that's one of the eliminations of the credit, physically taking it up. Once you get above 2,000 pounds, uh, it really functions as its own crop, right? It has its own nutrient needs, and it's taking it up. Now, why don't you get that back? You don't get that back because it's the, the carbon and nat- nitrogen ratio is, is too high. So when the microbes go to break down that material, there's not a lot, there's not nitrogen left over. With the legume, there's uh, what we say is a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the microbes, so microbes always start by stealing a little nitrogen from the soil, right? It takes a little bit away from the plant. But when it starts to decompose a legume cover crop, there's a lot of nitrogen left over at the end of that decomposition process. With rye, or with the grasses, it's a high nitrogen, it, it keeps stealing, it keeps stealing, it keeps stealing. It, as long as there's nitrogen in the soil, it's, the, the microbes are competing with the plant for that plant mature. So, I, can, I can't completely separate those two effects out, but the, I'm really attributing that it's, it's, it's one of the big things is the, the total amount of nitrogen is taking up, and it's really connected to that, um, connected to that manure. The other thing, though, is that this is not necessarily a bad thing, right? So it, uh, it depends on what your angle is. If you want, if you're expecting that manure, what are you using that manure for? If you want that manure to provide nutrients, nitrogen for that next crop, yeah, it, it can be a bad thing. But if we have manure that we need to put out on the landscape, I'd rather it get tied up in plant biomass than not, right? And if it's getting tied up in plant biomass, we're often more likely to grow more biomass. That's going to be incorporated into your soil and help help build or at least replenish some of that organic matter, especially if you have corn silage in rotation or any other crop that where you're, you're removing a lot of biomass, right? So that's the that's the trick. If you have all this carbon removal from the soil with whatever your crop may be, we got to think about how we want to replenish it, just to even break even. So uh, it is sealing it from a nutrient management perspective uh, in the short term, but over the long term, it's going to be building. Uh, potentially maintaining or building organic matter. So that ties into the big idea of, well, do you get it back? And that is, that's a big question. That's something that we've struggled as researchers to really capture. How do we identify that? I mean, ideally, if you are building organic matter in your soil, then your soil will be supplying more nitrogen to your crops, right? So in that sense, you'd be getting it back. But from a quantitative point of view, we don't have a recommendation to say, uh, or a measurement to say, okay, now you know that you can apply a little bit less nitrogen or that your soil is definitely supplying more nitrogen. Um, that's really one of the great, um, uh, that's one of the big limitations of what we've been able to, to evaluate in our production system. We don't, and even, even that, we really don't even properly uh, give credit to organic matter enough. So. Those are the things that we're working on next with trying to really help develop some criteria or some methods. How would we know that you're getting it back? How do we know you've built up your nitrogen, the available nitrogen uh, you know, to, to your crops and your soil? So um, that I don't know, and that's going to be a long-term, um, long-term research that we're, that we're hoping to work on. So I don't know, is that hopefully that answers some of those questions? It gets a little gets a little complicated, but the other thing is, too, is that these cover crops are really, really great for water quality, right? So, um, and it obviously depends on your cropping systems, but in terms of, you know, especially dairy-based cropping systems, you know, we got to have, we got to have more, uh, more wood for rye growing after, after corn silage. All right, so the other thing is that these recommendations are a bit specific. I do think it may, you know, they're certainly tied to uh, fall manure application. You know, all those little tweaks to the system is like, well, what if you have a cover crop in the fall that you put out your manure in the spring? Or what if you put your manure out after you plowed under a cover crop? How much tie up would there be? You know, those sort of tweaks to the system, I don't know. I think that, um, 
I think it probably the effect would be slightly less. I think that the big effect that we're seeing is that you, you have this direct take up of, of the nitrogen from that manure. So if you can decouple those things, you'll get more availability from your manure. Uh, and certainly with, with the fall, fall cover crop specifically. And I put the next crop as corn, but I also think it could be if you, it's another, if you have another high nitrogen demand crop that's there. So um, we're working in systems where we want a lot of supply out there for that crop to, to be able to have access to. Uh, if you're growing, you know, if you're following it with a legume or something like that, or, or soybean or, a, or a, any other bean crop, it's not going to probably have that big of an effect. If you're growing something like Golden Sedan grass or potatoes or, or sweet corn or, or something that is another high nitrogen main crop, I think to me this, this would also pertain to it. So things to pay attention for. If you're putting that nitrogen out and you're expecting it to be there, but you have this big cover crop biomass, it may not. Something to certainly pay attention to. Um, the other big thing is, do we need to lose yield? And we saw a lot of, of yield losses. And I, what I, the first thing that I like to present is, like, no, we don't. I did. I don't know if we always need to. And I have point to uh, some data from the practical farmers of Iowa that have done strip trials with this. And, you know, in the first couple years of their research, three of ten site years, they saw some yield drags falling winter rye. But since 2011, they haven't seen any yield effect. So most of the time, they're breaking even, which is really what, what we want. I mean, at least in, you know, these, these sort of grain production systems where the focus is erosion control and capturing nitrogen and for water quality benefits. No, I don't think you need to lose yield. I think that it's very easy to be a better farmer than I am. Um, I think the tricks are, can you keep the biomass low? Uh, keep it to, keep it to 1,000 pounds. Um, so you still want enough for erosion control but, and for some soil building, but not so much that you need to seal it. Uh, you want to wait 10 to 14 days between termination and planting. I think that's always a benefit. If you can, get a little, start, get a little nitrogen out there with the planter. Uh, we know that cover crops are going to deplete that root zone in available nitrogen. So if you, can, if you can supplement a little there, that's probably going to be a good thing. Have a good no-till planter set up. Can't stress that enough. There's obviously a lot of people in the room that are experts at this. Um, the other thing, too, is to move up the timing of your nitrogen. So if you're putting out, if you have some other nitrogen sources, instead of maybe doing it at planting or in season, maybe you want to move it up, maybe get some nitrogen out early in the year. Um, that, may, that may help alleviate some of that immobilization effect. Now, here's the thing, too. If you've got that 2,000... Can I interrupt you again? Can you go back to that slide? I just want to point out a few organic-specific things. In organic as well, um, we're looking typically with a rye cover crop before corn, we would be doing mechanical termination. That rule of thumb of 10 to 14 days that still applies, um, not only because of uh, potential nitrogen um, and, and seed bed issues, but it also helps alleviate um, issues with seed corn maggot and insect issues. So I would still follow that in organic. Um, and. Uh, with organic, there still is a possibility of, of adding uh, starter fertilizer, and pelletized poultry manure certainly is, is one option. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, there are, I think, some um, obviously some considerations with the, the end management in organic um, in terms of that, that timing of fertilizing, just the feasibility of getting that product on the field. So then the, then the other question is, well, what happens if it does, if you put out that cover crop and, it, and you put on this kind of biomass? And, and these really are cases where it's like, you know, if you, you plant that cover crop and sometimes you get nice warm Novembers, right? And you, you get a lot of biomass. So what happens there? This is really the risk, right? Or the thing you want to pay attention to when you're out in your fields. Okay, I got a lot of a grass cover crop out there and I'm going to plow it under. What's going to what's going to happen. So obviously get out there as early as possible. Um, the earlier the better. Any little bit of extra biomass you can, you can say from it putting on is going to be good. Um, what about the opportunity to harvest it as a side crop? Now granted, yeah, you have to have a use for it and you have to be, uh, you need it and want to ensile it and feed it. Um, herbicide rules obviously don't apply. Um, but the other interesting thing about it, from a nutrient management perspective, it's actually a little more beneficial. You've applied a lot of nutrients in the fall, you've collected it, and you're feeding it. You're double cropping the system. From a nutrient management perspective and a nutrient balance perspective, it's really good. You're able to, if you have, if you have access to manure, 
and you have uh, a, a place to, to, to feed that biomass, it, it, that's a really, really good thing. The, the idea is, well, maybe you want to switch up your crop. If you know you're going to have some tie-ups uh, and you maybe aren't looking to apply that much nitrogen to that next crop, maybe you want to switch, right? Maybe you want to grow soybean that next year. Maybe you want to grow a, a, a different, a less nitrogen domain crop. Um, or know that you have sequester that nitrogen in your soil, right? So chalk it up to a, uh, a soil building process, um, which isn't, isn't a bad thing. Everyone's got to have right. It depends what is your, what, what do you want out of that cover crop and what did you want out of that manure? So thinking about those things together, putting those two things together, cover crops and manure, love them. Let's, let's figure out how to use them more and get them working, working together.